Now we will be talking about the chemical bonds. And we're going to start with the introduction of a concept of an ion. So atoms are electrically neutral, but when they lose electrons, they will form positively. When they lose electrons, they will form positively charged ions. And when they gain electrons, they will form negatively charged ions. Ions can form so-called ionic bonds. And these ionic bonds are pretty strong because attractive forces between the positive and negative ions are also pretty strong. Generally speaking, chemical bonds form when atoms either lose or gain or share valence electrons in order to acquire so-called an octet or eight valence electrons. Eight electrons on the outer um, electron layer, electron orbital, electron energy level. When atoms achieve the octet on the outermost electron level, outermost electron orbital, they basically gain um, the noble gas arrangement of that outer shell and that makes them very very energetically in energy stable so um, ionic bonds happen when atoms of one element lose valence electrons while atoms of another element gain valence electrons so this is clear gain lose covalent bonds occur when atoms of various nonmetals share electrons and attain a noble gas arrangement so basically ionic bonds is when you know one atom uh, as a matter of fact ionic bonds basically is a uh, um, when you give your xbox to another person to play so you don't have an xbox anymore and they do and covalent bonds is when you share an xbox So this is an example and comparison between the um, ionic bond where electrons are transferred from metal to non-metal and this is an example of covalent bond when two electrons are shared between two non-metal atoms so that each atom achieves an octet. Let's talk a little bit about positive ions. Um, in this case metals lose electrons metals of the group 1a 2a and 3a so those are representative elements um, group 1a alkali metals usually lose one electron alkali earth metals lose two electrons and metals in the group 3a lose three electrons the reason why they lose electrons is because they have pretty low ionization energies and when they lose those electrons basically the outer shell of a metal is stripped and the shell under it becomes an outer one um, and they have now the same number of valence electrons as the noble gas near them usually it's eight so let's take a look at sodium atoms of sodium in group 1a are neutral and they have 11 electrons and 11 protons total on the outer shell they have only one valence electron here and this one valence electron is lost to some other atom which um, leaves sodium with 10 electrons the electron configuration of a noble gas and 11 protons 10 electrons and 11 protons make a positive ion with a charge positive charge of one Magnesium in group 2a, the atoms of magnesium are also neutral. They have 12 electrons and 12 protons. When they lose two electrons to whatever ion will receive them, whatever atom will receive them, they will have the same number of valence electrons as the closest noble gas, which is neon, and they will have an octet outside eight electrons on the outer shell, so they form the ion with 10 electrons and 12 protons which makes the charge of that ion plus two now nonmetals 
in the groups 5a, 6a, and 7a have pretty high ionization energy, so it's almost impossible to strip them of the electrons on the outer shell, but they will readily accept electrons. When they gain one or more valence electrons, they can form ions with a negative charge. They will be <clears throat> gaining electrons until they have the same number of valence electrons as the noble gas that is near, um, and it's going to be eight valence electrons again on the outer shell. Here's an example. Chlorine in group 7a, as an atom is neutral, it has 17 electrons total and 17 protons total. Uh, they will gain one electron and that will make them having the same number of valence electrons as the noble gas argon. And the outer energy level will be filled with eight electrons. The result of that electron acquisition will be an ion with 18 electrons and 17 protons. And the charge, therefore, will be negative one. So here are some examples of the common ions. On the left, you can see metals after they lose electrons. So that's your first A, second A, and third A groups. On the right, you can see nonmetals, representative nonmetals from 5A, 6A, and 7A groups. So here you can see that actually the charges for the ions of the representative elements match the group number. Okay? So for instance, well, to some extent, for instance, let's take a look here. Uh, group number 1A, the charge is plus 1. Group number 2a, charge is plus 2. Group number 3a, the charge is plus 3. Now, what about nonmetals? You need to subtract the group number from 8. So here, 8 minus 7, minus 1. 8 minus 6, minus 2. 8 minus 5, minus 3. Ions that are formed as the result of losing or gaining electrons can form what's called an ionic compound. The ionic compounds consist of positive and negative ions, and positive and negative ions form ionic bonds. Um, therefore, this ionic bonds is very, very strong, very high energy, and that explains why ionic compounds, most of them have high melting points, and all of them are solid at room temperature. A good example of an ionic compound will be sodium chloride. It is a table salt. Now, if you would look at sodium as a metal and the chlorine as a gas, neither of them reminds uh, of any properties of the common table salt. If you would look using various types of electron microscopy at the crystal structure of the um, table salt, you will see that Sodium and chloride ions are arranged in a certain order in a crystal of a table salt. So we already introduced the idea of the chemical formula. The chemical formula represents the ratio of the atoms or ions in the chemical compound. And in order to read that ratio, and the ratio is whole number ratio, we use symbols for the elements and subscripts. Subscripts demonstrate how many ions or atoms of a particular element can be found in the compound. The important feature of ionic compounds, not only ionic compounds, the uh, molecules of compounds are always uh, electrically neutral. So the sum of charges in the compound equals zero. So total positive charge in the ionic compound should be equivalent to total negative charge in the ionic compound. Let's say sodium and chloride. Sodium is charged with plus one. Charge in the chloride is minus one, which makes it neutral. Plus one, minus one, zero. Magnesium chloride, same story. Magnesium loses two electrons. 
and becomes magnesium 2 plus. Now two chlorine atoms each gain one electron from magnesium and that makes them two chlorides with each of them is going to have a charge of negative one. So now I have two plus from magnesium and two minuses from chloride electrically negative electrically neutral I'm sorry so how do you balance the charges in ionic compound you always should remember that the total positive charge should be equivalent to the total negative charge so let's say sodium sulfide sulfide has two negative charges sodium has only one positive charge so you need two sodium ions to balance two negative charges the sulfide ion so the formula will be sodium 2s now how do you name ionic compounds first you write the name of the metal and the name of the metal is the same as the name of the element the name of the non-metal is changed you take the first syllable of the non-metal and add the ending ide so between the name of a metal and non-metal ion you put a space example this potassium this element is iodine so you take the first syl syllable and add ide getting iodide magnesium is unchanged now bromine you take the first syllable and add ide so bromide aluminum is unchanged oxygen you take the first syllable and add ide so oxide when you name you need to identify the cation and the nine name the cation by the element name the nine by using the first syllable in the ide and then you write the name of the cation the positively charged ion first and the anion the negatively charged ion second so for instance here first is potassium okay here let's name anion so the name of anion oxygen you take first syllable it becomes oxide so this is potassium oxide now next we're going to talk about the metals with a variable charge so what about the transitional metals um, many transitional metals except for zinc cadmium and silver you can see it here they may can form more than more than one positive ions positive cations in this case a roman numeral that represents the ion charge is placed uh, after the metal name in parenthesis copper 2 copper 1 iron 2 iron 3 these are some examples of the metals that have more than one positive ion. Uh, we already mentioned copper, for instance, lead can have lead 2 and lead 4, nickel, nickel 2 and nickel 3, gold, gold 1 and gold 3. So how do you determine which charge the transitional metal in the compound carries? For instance, we have manganese fluoride. How do we know the manganese charge we know that two fluoride ions present the total negative charge of minus two to balance it out manganese has to have a positive charge of two as well so the for the name of the compound will be manganese two fluoride these are some charges in order to know what you need to know um, i listed the base basically if you know the charges for these ions you should be fine so now how do we name ionic compounds with metals that show variable charge basically with transitional metals let's take a look at um, iron chloride and we know that chloride brings total of two negative charges iron on the other hand brings to has to bring two positive charges to balance out two negative charges on chloride so that 
all together gives us iron 2 chloride. And the opposite, as we already mentioned, so here you know that chloride is two negative charges, so iron will be two positive, iron two chloride. Oxygen is two negative charges, so total of negative six, so iron has to be positive three, iron three oxide, copper three phosphide, and so on and so forth. So you need to identify a cation and a nine, you need to balance the charges and then write the formula from the name. Let's say we need to write the formula for iron 3 chloride. We know that cation is iron. We know that anion is chloride. We know that iron is iron 3, which means three positive charges. And we already know that chloride has one negative charge. So in order to have them balanced, you've got to have three negatively charged chloride ions to balance one triple positively charged iron. This multiplicator, 3, becomes a subscript in the formula. The answer is iron chloride 3. Uh, sometimes you in, in ionic compounds, you have not a, uh, the ions formed from the elements, but so-called polyatomic ions. It's a group of atoms that carry an overall charge as a group. Often they consist of non-metal and an oxygen. Sulfur and oxygen, phosphorus and oxygen, carbon and oxygen. Most of them have negative one, negative two, or negative three charge. Most of them have negative charge. Ammonium, on the other hand, NH4 plus, has single positive charge. The list of polyatomic anions and cations, well, basically ammonium, that you need to know uh, are those. Those ions are listed. In the study guide. Now, how do you name polyatomic ions? Uh, most of them, with highest number of oxygen, um, they end with usually they end with eight, like phosphoric acid, sulfate, phosphoric acid, phosphate, for nitric acid, nitrate. When the number of oxygens is one less. It's not eight, but eight. So instead of sulfate, sulfite. Instead of phosphate, phosphite. Instead of nitrate, nitrite. Couple of examples. Cn minus is cyanide, or H minus is hydroxide. Now, when you add hydrogen, positively charged ion to the polyatomic anion, it adds plus one to the charge. So carbonate, you add hydrogen, hydrogen carbonate. Sulfate, hydrogen sulfate. The common term, instead of hydrogen sulfate or hydrogen carbonate, to say bisulfate or bicarbonate. Uh, the names of polyatomic ions with halogens, there are four of them and they can be quite tricky. So if we start with this polyatomic ion, which contains uh, chlorine atom and oxygen, it's hypochlorite. Then you have, you add one oxygen, you get chlorite. You get three oxygen, you get chlorate. And four oxygen per chlorate. How do you write formulas for the compounds that contain polyatomic ions? So let's say we have a name here, magnesium nitrate. Remember, we use the same charge balance rules that we use for simple ionic compounds. We just operate on the presumption that nitrate works as a single anion. So magnesium ion has two positive charges. Nitrate ion as a whole, as a whole, has one negative charge. So in order to balance two positive charges of magnesium and negative charges of nitrate, we have to have two nitrate ions. Therefore, the formula for magnesium nitrate will be magnesium NO3 taken two times. You put the, if you need to add subscript to the polyatomic 
anion, you put polyatomic anion in parentheses and it's subscript. So let's practice a little bit here. Let's say we need to write a formula for aluminum bicarbonate. We already mentioned that bicarbonate is equivalent to hydrogen carbonate. So cation will be aluminum, three positive charges. Polyatomic ion will be HCO3 minus. In order to balance three positive charges in aluminum with three negative charges um, in the it, with a negative charge in bicarbonate, we need to take three bicarbonates for one each one aluminum. This three becomes a subscript. Here's your formula. Again, since we have more than one polyatomic anion, we have to put it in the parenthesis and put the subscript that relates to the whole anion outside of the parenthesis. How do we name polyatomic ions based on formula? So first you have to write a positive ion, usually it's going to be a metal. Like in these examples, aluminum, iron, sodium. And then you write the name of polyatomic ion. Sodium sulfate, aluminum carbonate. If it's a transitional metal, then you add the specific number of charges up to the name, like in this case it's going to be iron 3 phosphate. So this is some formulas for some of the salts that contain polyatomic ions, of course it's not uh, extensive in any in any way. So again, let's take a look at naming. So this is your flow chart. So you need to identify cation and anion, non-metal. So metal or ammonium, uh, if it forms just one positive ion, group 1A, 3A, zinc, silver, or cadmium, you just use the name of the element. If it can form more than one positive ion, then use the element name and use a Roman numeral that equals to the charge. Non-metal ion, if it is formed by just one atom, monatomic ion, such as chloride or sulfide, first syllable of the element name, chlor, and then you add ide. It's a group of atoms. You just use the name for that specific polyatomic ion. Next, we're going to talk about molecular compounds, covalent bonds, and how they can share the electrons. So what is different between the molecular and ionic compounds? Turns out, in molecular compounds, the bonds are formed by sharing electrons. And the number of covalent bonds that various nonmetal atoms form is usually equal to the number of electrons that these atoms need to achieve a stable octet electron arrangement. So molecular compounds form when atoms of two or more nonmetals share electrons forming covalent bond. Covalent bond is formed by sharing valence electrons, and that sharing allows those nonmetal atoms to achieve a stable octet configuration with the outer shell. So sharing of electrons by two or more atoms forms what is called a molecule. An example would be a hydrogen molecule. Two atoms of hydrogen move closer, and positive charge of the nucleus of one atom attracts the electron of another atom. When they are close enough, they start sharing the electron pair that forms a covalent bond. That sharing gives each atom an arrangement of a noble gas, arrangement of helium, and the molecule becomes more stable than each individual hydrogen atom. So here you can see how hydrogens are far apart and there's no attraction, but then they move closer and form a hydrogen molecule which is energetically preferable to two individual hydrogen atoms. To demonstrate how electrons are shared, we use electron dot formulas. Uh, we draw electron dot uh, formulas 
symbols for each fluorine atom, the Lewis structures, you remember them from the previous conversation. And the single electrons, single uh, unpaired electrons uh, on the outer shell, they will be shared. Okay, so you have three lone pairs, and you have one bonding or shared pair, which forms a single bond between two fluorine atoms. If you will look closer, you will notice that each atom in the molecule of fluorine has a, an octet. Now, these elements shown here exist as diatomic molecules. So, they form covalent bonds between two individual atoms. Usually, the number of electrons that a nonmetal shares and the number of covalent bonds that it forms are equal. Um, so, and that will give us the um, number of electrons that that nonmetal has to have to achieve a noble gas arrangement. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that let's say you have well, hydrogen is kind of a bit of an exception, um, as well as boron. Um, they do not form octets. But let's say let's let's do something more representative. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So what you get, they need one more electron to achieve an octet, so they will form one bond. Oxygen and sulfur needs they need two electrons to achieve an octet. They will usually form two bonds. Nitrogen and phosphate need three more electrons, so they will form three bonds. Carbon and silicon. They need four electrons, so they will form four bonds. Uh, for instance, let's take a look methane. In methane, you have carbon and four hydrogens. Okay, so we draw an electron dot symbol for carbon and electron dot, electron dot symbol for hydrogen. So carbon needs four hydrogens atoms uh, to complete its noble gas configuration, and hydrogen needs just one. So here's what you're going to get in the end. Here you can see some um, electron dot formulas for molecules like methane, ammonia, and water. In all cases, you can see that hydrogen since it's in, the, it's in the first period it does not require to have an octet on the outer shell it requires to have only two electrons because then it will form a noble gas arrangement of helium so here you can see in methane hydrogen and carbon all have the stable configuration hydrogen has two electrons and carbon has eight nitrogen and hydrogen and ammonia same story oxygen and water oxygen and hydrogen and water Now, uh, there are some exceptions to the octet rule. We already mentioned hydrogen. Also, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, and iodine sometimes can form compounds where they will have 10 or 12 valence electrons. For instance, sulfur in sulfur hexafluoride uh, has 12 valence electrons or 6 bonds to the atom of sulfur. So double bond occurs when um, there are remaining electrons that are not supposed to be there. And these electrons are shared to form an extra bond. Okay. So atoms in this case share two pairs of electrons. Triple bond occurs when atoms share three pairs of electrons. When there are remaining electrons that are not supposed to be there and they share to form more bonds. So let's take a look at drawing electron dot formulas. Let's say carbon dioxide. So we need to figure out how many valence electrons are in the carbon and oxygen. So four electrons in the carbon and total of 12 electrons in the two molecules of oxygen because each oxygen has six uh, valence electrons. Uh, total is going to be 16 valence electrons in this molecule and they got to be shared okay 
So um, we draw first a formula for carbon dioxide with just one bond between each oxygen and carbon here. So that takes away four electrons. So we have 12 left. Okay. Now, if you place them, there are a couple of electrons, electron pairs here and here, that will be shared to help carbon to achieve the octet. Okay. If you just distribute it first, um, let's see if I can, if I can zoom in. So if you just um, let me remove all the ink on the slide, and then going to do okay. Look at this structure here. If we distribute electrons like this, you will notice that while oxygen has an octet, carbon doesn't. So two electrons from each oxygen will be shared between that oxygen and the carbon to help carbon to achieve octet. So you've got double bonds. Now let's take a look at uh, nitrogen. Okay, so you draw um, two um, nitrogens next to each other, you distribute electrons between them, and you suddenly see that each nitrogen has unpaired electron. Okay, so you line them up, and now you have an octet for each nitrogen, and nitrogens in the molecule are connected by triple bond. How do you name covalent compounds? The first nonmetal is named by the name of the element. Second nonmetal is named by using the syllable followed by "-ide". Prefix, okay, uh, is if, if subscript is used in the formula, then you use a prefix in front of the name. Let me demonstrate what it is. So, those are prefixes. If subscript is one, it's mono. If subscript is two, it's di. If, subs if subscript is tr three, it's tri, and so on and so forth. So let's take a look. Carbon, subscript is two, di, sulf, ide. CO2, carbon dioxide. N2O, di, nitrogen, oxide. SO3, sulfur trioxide. So how do we name molecular compounds? Already described. So let's take a look. It's going to be nitrogen, the first nonmetal. And the second element, trichloride. So nitrogen trichloride. And then based on the name, we can also write formulas. So diboron trioxide. Di means two. Tri means three. Boron symbol is B. Oxygen oxide first to oxygen means O. So we need to write down B two O three. How do we know if compound is ionic or covalent? In ionic compounds. The first element is in overwhelming majority of cases a metal or ammonia. So in potassium oxide, it's the ionic compound because potassium is a metal. Covalent compounds usually have first element as a non-metal. So like dinitrogen oxide. Nitrogen is a non-metal, so compound is covalent. Now let's talk about electronegativity. Um, Electronegativity of an element indicates how strong an atom of that element attracts the shared electrons in a particular bond. In terms of the periodic table, electronegativity goes up when you move from left to right across the period. And it increases from bottom to the top of the periodic table when you move along the group. Electronegativity is high for nonmetals. Uh, with fluorine having the highest and low for nonmetals, with cesium having the lowest. Here are some electronegativity is measured in arbitrary units. Fluorine has a 
4.0 while cesium has 0.7 so there's some electronegativities you don't need to memorize and god forbid none of this is 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 necessary um, now when you have two um, atoms the same element forming um, a diatomic molecule like two hydrogens electrons are shared equally because the electronegativity of these two atoms is the same and uh, none of those attracts electrons stronger but if you have a bond formed by often atoms of two different elements one is more electronegative than another in this case it's a chlorine uh, atom and chlorine actually uh, moves kind of you know pulls electrons towards itself creating uh, an even distribution of charges creating slightly negative charge on chlorine atom and slightly positive charge on the hydrogen atom this is called a nonpolar covalent bond um, so nonpolar is sorry this is called this this is called polar covalent bond now nonpolar covalent bond example was hydrogen uh, occurs when two non-metals share electrons equally or almost equally so electronegativity difference between two non-metals is very small examples would be uh, bond with, between nitrogens bond between chlorine and bromine or bond between hydrogen and silicon you know because the difference is, is rather small now polar covalent bond occurs uh, when two non-metal atoms share electrons unevenly and have some electronegativity difference substantial electronegativity difference oxygen and chlorine chlorine and carbon oxygen and sulfur have a pretty large difference in terms of the electronegativity so as the difference of electronegativity increases polar covalent bond becomes more polar so charges in the polar covalent bond become separated and this is called a dipole generally speaking uh, the polar covalent bond starts 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 when uh, the difference in electronegativity is 0.5 or higher anything less than that like in this example will be considered nonpolar now um, in order to designate the dipole we put a lower k Greek letter Delta with a positive or negative charge to the corresponding um, atoms that attract like oxygen or give away like carbon electron density another way to do is an arrow which points towards the negative end of a dipole now ionic bond occurs between the metals and non-metals uh, usually the difference in electronegativity is huge and as we discussed it before ionic bond is the result of electron transfers for instance uh, generally considered more than 1.8 so chlorine and potassium 2.2 sodium and nitrogen 2.1 sulfur and cesium 1.8 so ionic bonds now uh, if we know the difference in electronegativity values between two atoms we can predict the type of chemical bond so this is summarizes number wise how electronegativity difference can reflect the type of the bond so this table shows you the nonpolar covalent bond with equal sharing of electrons polar covalent with unequal sharing of electrons and ionic bond in which electrons are simply transferred some examples of um, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonds for you. And we're going to move on to the conversation about the shapes of the molecules and polarity of the molecules. So here you have carbon that bonds with four hydrogen atoms. So in order for these, these bonds to have the minimal repulsion is for this molecule to have tetrahedral shape with um, hydrogens being in the apexes of the tetrahedron uh, and the angle between two bonds will be 109 
degrees. This is how we write it down. So we're gonna um, we're gonna try to write down formulas and try to determine the geometry of the the the, the compound. So it's called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory of Vesper. So this theory describes the orientation um, of electron groups around the central atom. So electron groups should be arranged as far apart as possible around the central atom. And the specific shape of a molecule is determined by the number of atoms attached to the central one. So let's start with the central atoms which have two electron groups. One electron group and another electron group. So two electron groups are placed around the central atom, carbon, so that the repulsion is minimized when they are linear, okay, when bond angle is 180 degrees Celsius. It makes sense because if you will try to move them closer together, they will start to uh, repel each other stronger around here. Now three electron groups here you have a molecule of formaldehyde. So you have an electron group here, here, and here. When you place these three electron groups around the central atom, the repulsion will be minimized if those angles between the bonds are all equal at 120 degrees. This is the trigonal platter shape. Now, in some cases, you have three electron groups but one of them does not form a bond so here you have a molecule of sulfur dioxide which has three electron groups bond with oxygen bond with oxygen and one lone pair repulsion will be minimized if you place these bonds sorry these electron groups as far apart as possible but since we do not represent on a stick model the lone pair of electrons the angle between the bonds between sulfur and oxygen will be 120 degrees so it may appear that it's not that that it should be linear but it's not because there is one sort of an invisible an invisible electron group right here which consists of the lone pair of electrons uh, four electron groups a molecule of methane the repulsion between the four electron groups that i just crossed is minimal if the angle between all four of them is 109 degrees celsius uh, degrees just sorry 109 degrees it's just a, too, too long of a lecture and this can be achieved only if hydrogen's sitting in the apexes of the tetrahedron now in some cases the one of four electron groups uh, will be a lone pair okay so three electron groups are three bonds like in a molecule of nitrogen and the fourth electron group is a lone pair we still put them in the tetrahedron but in this apex of tetrahedron is the lone pair so we don't represent it on a molecular the, the graphic the structural formula of a molecule and this is what you have there's still 109 uh, 109 degrees uh, angles but we do not show this lone pair which actually sticks right about here water water is interesting because in case of water you still have four electron groups you have two bonds with hydrogen and two lone pairs so they form a tetrahedron with a bond angles of 109 but since we do not depict lone pairs we just have this bent shape okay uh, formula of water so this is some molecular shapes that i want you to know now let's try and predict some of those molecular shapes using the vesper theory now let's try and uh, use the knowledge that we just got um, to predict the shape of different molecules so we start with hydrogen sulfide so we've got um we need to figure out what are the electron groups here so you have two bonds and two lone pairs so considering this it will be shaped in a tetrahedron but we're not 
picturing the lone pairs, so it's going to have a bent shape. Nonpolar molecules uh, such as hydrogen, chlorine, or oxygen, and nonpolar, they, they, you know, they're nonpolar bonds, which means that they are um, linear and they do not have any polarity. Now, molecules with polar bonds can be either nonpolar or polar. So, for instance, if the dipoles in each bond cancel due to the symmetrical arrangement. So, for instance, CO2 is a linear molecule and these two dipoles cancel each other. Um, carbon tetrachloride um, is nonpolar molecule because these four dipoles oriented in tetrahedral fashion and they cancel each other. Now, polar molecules like hydrogen chloride polar because one end of the molecule is more negatively charged than the other and the polar bonds don't cancel each other and electrons are shared unequally in such polar covalent bond in the molecule like water you have two dipole bonds uh, both bonds between hydrogen and oxygen are polar and they do not cancel because of the orientation of those bonds at an angle so the more negative end of the dipole is oxygen and more positive is uh, two hydrogens. And same is true for um, ammonium. So if you look at this, you've got three dipoles and they are oriented in a way that they do not cancel. So nitrogen will carry a slightly negative charge and the, the positive end of the molecule will be at the side of, of hydrogens. So how we determine the polarity of the molecule, say, uh, OF2. So we need to, first of all, make sure that we know the shape of the molecule. And it is bent because of two lone pairs on oxygen. So what you end up with is two dipoles where um, electron density is shifted towards Florence. But these dipoles are oriented in a way that these dipoles do not cancel each other. How do we know that? These, these bonds are polar because the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and fluorine is 0.5, which basically classifies those bonds as polar covalent. Uh, now, knowledge about the uh, attractive forces that are derived from um, distribution of charges, uh, are, it's important to understand the shape of proteins, for instance. So in covalent compounds, uh, polar molecules can exhibit attractive forces that are called dipole dipole interactions. Uh, and some strong attractions called hydrogen bonds are formed between hydrogen atoms that are bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, and a lone pair of on fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Hydrogen bonds are extremely important in life sciences, and they're the strongest force between the molecules and between the molecules. They play a major role in the shape of DNA and proteins. So here's the uh, the dipole-dipole interaction between two molecules of hydrochloric uh, acid, or not hydrochloric acid, but hydrogen chloride. So chloride is slightly negative, hydrogen is slightly positive, positive and negative uh, charges attract to each other forming dipole-dipole interaction. Now dispersion forces are weak attractions between nonpolar molecules. In this case, the molecules form what's called temporary dipole. When molecules simply bump into each other, there is momentarily um, momentary change in the distribution of charges within the molecule. When it becomes asymmetrical, that creates very temporary dipole. Those temporary dipoles start to interact with each other, and that is uh, forming dispersion forces. This explains why nonpolar molecules, such as, let's say, bromine, can form liquids. Now, uh, what is the importance of um, attractive forces and the influence on the melting points of compounds? The so strength of attractive forces often determines the melting points of compounds. Generally speaking, melting points of compounds are lower if the forces that act between the molecules are weak, such as dispersion forces. If the molecules that act between the 
molecules are higher, such as um, hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole interaction, the melting points uh, are going to be higher. And as you all know, melting points are highest in the ionic compounds because there are very strong attractive forces between the ions in the compound. So this exemplifies by some uh, examples of the substances. So ionic bonds demonstrate really high melting points. Hydrogen bonds demonstrate lower, but dipole-dipole attractions even lower. And dispersion forces demonstrate basically the lowest melting point. So this is the comparison of bonding and attractive forces. So in the ionic bond, the strength of attractive forces is very strong. Uh, in the covalent bond, not as strong. Now, between molecules, hydrogen bonds are the strongest. Dipole-dipole attractions, second strongest, and dispersion forces, the weakest.